Well, what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls. You change your number. I mean, I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. You don't get it. You just, you don't get it. I think sometimes it feels like maybe I'm like I'm in an unhealthy relationship with my comic books. I remember, uh, you know, before House of X, Powers of Ten, the X Men were just so, in such a terrible place. It was like X Men Red, X Men Yellow, X Men Blue. I think they did like the X Men Black, uh, like one offs. I think they're all like one shots or something like this. And you're like, this is the best X Men you can do. And then all of a sudden, we got a word: we're bringing back Uncanny X Men. You know, we're we're rebooting the line. You know, everything's going to be good. And then you're like, well, it can't get any worse. And then you, you start hearing it's like Kelly Thompson, Matthew Rosenberg. <laughs> it, like there's four writers for Uncanny X-Men when it relaunches. You're like, what the hell is going on here? You're like, well, at least, you know, Ed, I think Ed Brisson was associated with that one. You know, at least Ed Brisson was still writing. Um, you know, I think he was finishing up Extermination at the time. And he was going to be doing like the new uh, X-Force book. So at least there was some good news. And. Like you get in there and you start reading that uncanny X Men, you're like, "What the hell is Marvel selling me here? This is just as bad, if not worse, than what we already had." And then you you find out it's also they could like go into this Age of X Men like event book, or not event book, like event series to where uh, you know. So they did Uncanny X Men every issue for a week for ten issues, so they could jump like fast track into this this event, and then you find out they're doing all of that just because they were new. They were rebooting X-Men again in the same fucking year, man. Yeah. yeah. They had... Like, why do I keep coming back for this shit, Yule? <laughs> You're a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> we're all suckers, I think. Uh, there's... Uh... So, when that X-Men story was going on, and it was weekly, not only did it go 10 consecutive issues, but then an annual came out the very next week. And even though it was going bi-weekly, the 11th issue came out the week after the annual. So it was actually 12 straight weeks of X-Men comic books. And that annual was more expensive. I think the 10th issue was more expensive. The first issue yes, was definitely was more when, expensive. It was when uh, Cyclops came back. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was so the first they, reunion of Cyclops and, and Wolverine. Exactly. I, I kind of like that series. And when... You hope, <laughs> we hope as comic book fans that what we read was not important, uh, unimportant, that something would make sense for the reason why I spent that money. And as you're going through those weeks, you're like, well, this is probably the best uncanny X-Men I've read because gold and blue and, and black and red really weren't that great. I mean, those sometimes there were elements that were good. But even before that, you had the Extraordinary X-Men and All-New X-Men and Uncanny X-Men, and some people felt those were good. But do any of those stories matter to what we're reading now? Maybe the Rosenberg stuff with the characters dying off and then coming back like they are, maybe that kind of ties in loosely. But all that other stuff beforehand, it doesn't. And we're just hoping as fans, if we're reading this kind of stuff, you know, mainstream comic books, that something that we read will matter. And I think that's why we suffer the way we do. You go back on it. Let's say you actually invested in Age of X-Men. You were excited for the relaunch to, to get halfway through the event and realize it was all being rebooted again. You're like, why am I spending this money? Why would they do this to me? Like I said, it's an unhealthy relationship. Why Why would I want to give you my, my trust and my affection if you're just going to turn around and treat me like that? I can do better than that, can I? Yeah, you can. There's a lot of other companies that are out there that uh, <laughs> hopefully won't disrespect you. But again, if we're talking mainstream, they uh, <laughs> they are they're looking at the the bottom line. You know, they they got to make a dollar, and it felt like so that age of X Man, or even before all that stuff that led up to it. In the moment, they were like, this is the most important X-Men. This is going to be the stuff that you're going to care about going forward. All the while, they knew, without telling anybody, that House of X and you know Powers of Ten were going to be coming out. And that that it's was going to change later. everything. Yeah. And then when you finally found out, you're like, I'm in the middle of all this crap. Why am I still reading it? I don't know. That's probably one of the most 
I don't know. I'm sure if I really stretched hard, I could probably figure out some other things that are equally bad. I think DC had Millennium back in the day. That was a pretty crappy series that I felt I was being abused reading. I'm sitting there and, uh, you know, I, I'm not enjoying uh, Tom King's Batman run. You know, it's very well documented on the channel, uh, leading right up into issue 50, and especially after issue 50, everything goes to hell. But at the same time, Nightwing had gotten hot. Like, like it, was, it was a good series. They finally, they had a couple of fill-in writers. There was a really great issue by Michael Morrissey. And then uh, Ben Percy comes along. Oh, yeah. He takes over Nightwing. And all of a sudden, it's, it's like really a really great compelling storyline i'm like great nightwing's you know my second favorite dc character this is all going great and they just shoot dick off in the head <laughs> that's like a lot of head references all in one sentence <laughs> <laughs> i know rick grayson sucks we all know that <laughs> i can't i can't go and then they go and have uh, Dick Grayson shot in the head in Batman and Tom King's run and ruin the character. And the, the, that series has been complete crap since. And Ben Percy had to leave because he knew it was crap. Those are events that happened. We, they knew that those two weren't going to get married. They knew that they were going to shoot Dick in the head and, you know, undo everything right now. I don't know, man. It, what happened to the days when they would actually get together and say, this is the way our universe is going to go for the, for the time. Maybe that happened. And it, again, they just didn't let us know up front. And I mean, there's a certain amount of not wanting to know what's going to happen in, you know, before it happens I, with the internet and bleeding cool and just previews telling you a lot of what's going to happen going forward. It's funny how you don't know when there's going to be a new character until like a few days before the comic book comes out. Uh, that would be yeah, like the one time I'd enough. actually be yeah. happy that I know <laughs> that this is happening. But yeah, yeah, they they undo and and it's almost like they don't have any care for you. <laughs> That's like what we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? It's an it's an unhealthy relationship. And then finally, so I'm reading this Rick Grayson crap, and Scott Lobdell is not a bad writer. In mm -hmm. fact, I would say his flash forward was borderline amazing. His Red Hood until he got rid of the outlaws was actually really good. He gets in there with Rick Grayson. And it's complete trash. I can't read it. And they announce he's leaving it. They're bringing in Dan Jurgens. Dan Jurgens basically rescued the very end of Green Lanterns. Fine. Dan Jurgens is a good writer. I'm going to get back in there. I have my hope again. You're bringing me back in, DC. You're giving me the hope that I need that maybe Dick Grayson, Rick Grayson, whoever he is, can be salvaged. It's still completely terrible. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, hmm. May, uh, there's nobody invested in this character. Even though he is still Dick Grayson, he's not. And everybody is just waiting for the day he goes back to being normal, I'd assume. Mm -hmm. uh, making all of this stuff that we're reading during Rick pretty much unimportant. Uh, nobody likes it, really. <laughs> nobody likes it. Let's be real. Uh, I haven't read it in a while. When I, I read when he first got shot and then he was recovering from that. And trying to figure out who he was. And then he adopted the Rick name. I was out after that. I'm like, I read enough. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't imagine like anybody issues. that loves it. Pardon me? I made it through like four issues. I dropped yeah. off. Jurgens came back. I went in and read uh, one issue. And the first issue, issue when Jurgens was back, it was all like, it was all centered around the firefighter that is now one of the Nightwings. Because there's four Nightwings and Rick Grayson that's like their sidekick. And and that issue was cool when it actually explained what about the, the back story of this firefighter. I was like, this is actually pretty cool. I enjoyed this. The next issue was Rick focused again, and I was like, I can't read it because it's terrible. Because mm. this isn't Dick Grayson, this is bullshit. Yeah, you know, there's I, I shouldn't say like you know, there's a bad character. It's just when you're going in to read Nightwing, there's only one Nightwing, you know. This isn't even yeah, you know, who will don the cowl when Batman's gone? That's something that piques people's curiosity. Uh, nobody cares who else is going to be Nightwing. <laughs> you know, it's Dick Grayson, this guy right here. You can have a storyline where he gets shot and doesn't remember who he is, has amnesia, and it has to work his way to getting... But this is like status quo right now. And again, nobody believes that this is going to really be the thing. And so when a new writer comes on, you're... Uh, 
this is how they dangle that little carrot in front of us as comic fans. Hey, Dan Jurgens, this guy who did all this stuff that you remember is coming on this book. Well, we don't know if he's really on to stay. I mean, look at the Wonder Woman writers up until they get their new writer. It's like, until they announce who their big writer is, you know that this person that you like, whether it's Ram V or Dan Jurgens or you know Jason Aaron maybe, this person is only going to be on this book for a certain amount of time. And there's really no reason to get invested in these stories. There's another thing that Marvel does all the time and DC starting to do it now is they do this bait and switch bullshit mm -hmm. constantly to where, uh, Oh, we're announcing the new big title and Steve McNiven's the artist. You're like, great. That's going to be a great pairing. Well, guess how many issues he's doing three. And then yeah. he's off to do something else, and then it's Joe McFucknugget that you never heard of and ain't that can't hold a candle to him, isn't even in the same style or whatever. Maybe he comes back and illustrates the last issue that makes the whole you know story incoherent, you know, visually speaking. If you want to actually even go get the trade, and DC does this stuff and a lot too. I'm like, oh man, Robert Venditti and Doug Mankey on Justice League together couldn't be more excited. He's only four or five issues into his run, he's on his third fucking artist yeah justice league actually really pissed me off <laughs> when when they said oh venditti and monkey are going to be on this book together and i'm like this is like you said great team i like the justice league i love the art i like the writer quite a bit this is like a chance for him actually to really blow up he's working on superman like a lot of people want he's got batman wonder woman all the other characters that you expect to see and Monkey's off, what, on the second issue? There's also a really good, what, Lepresti was doing it after that? Yeah, I and think then, like you Frankie, said, Lepresti, Mankey, Lepresti, and now they're on, um, yeah, on, and, on the third art. And Venditti's not going to stay on the book. It's mm -hmm. going to be some other person. I can't remember who right now. Um, maybe somebody good, but then do I really have any hopes that they're going to stick around for a while or the artists that they choose? Or at least if it's a team of artists, can at least become that team rather than a third or fourth person. Justice League was like that also. You know, Jim Chang, you know, you laugh when you hear that he's going to do a book because you know he only can do a few books a year. Um, maybe just put him on annuals personally. And then you have, you know, Jorge Jimenez, and I can't remember all the different illustrators that worked on that series. All very good, but not necessarily, you know, what I'm expecting. And if you can't really grab on to... Uh, it, I don't know. It depends on what you're doing. If it, it, why you're a fan, are you a fan because you you know there's people that only read Superman. I mean, as a, a title, they only read a title, and they don't care about who the people are that are working on it. But when you finally start paying attention to who the creators are, and then you see those bait and switches, like you say, look, I want McDivin on the book for a while. You know, come on, <laughs> you know. But if mm -hmm. it's not a mini series, it's probably not going to be that way for almost anything. Obviously, you've been uh, reading comics a lot longer than I have. You're actually in the industry. There has to be a, a time or two when you're like, what am I still doing here? Mm -hmm. Like, nope, these people do not respect me. They don't respect my time. They certainly don't respect my money. Yeah, that's where the other comic companies come in. Chip Zdarsky, can I, can I just go off on a little tangent? I, I think yeah. I remember us talking about it. He got jobbed out when he didn't get that Fantastic Four job. <laughs> yeah, there's another example. I remember, wasn't it Jim Chung was the artist on Marvel Two and One, and it, it was the the best comic book that Marvel had at the time, bar none. It wasn't even close. Uh, I think maybe Thanos wins might have been finishing up or whatever, but there was a time when that was easily the best, and I think it went through four artists in twelve issues. Yeah, it, towards the end they were just trying to chunk you know get those out i think is what it was tbd is like if it worsen to be determined as an artist is someone i've never heard of <laughs> that's not selling anything you know that doesn't tell me anything who's this person that you dug up you know i might as well <laughs> it's like a crowdfunded comic book from somebody you know some artist i don't know you know it's mm -hmm. the same thing and it then you think was. about like the creator. What what incentivizes Chip Zdarsky to go out there and write the best uh, reintroduction of the Fantastic Four into the Marvel universe? 
that that he can do if you're just gonna give give his slot away to slot of Octavius. <sighs> Uh, Dan uh, Slot has sales records. Uh, Chip Zdarsky is still working his way up as a writer. You know, he was a he's a double threat as an artist, but he's not really you know a Marvel artist uh, per se. So he's like kind of building his career as a writer. That's probably why they didn't give him quite the Fantastic Four. Even though almost anybody that came in my store, anything I've seen like on the internet. People were like clamoring for this guy to be the bu- guy to write the next Fantastic Four, and they didn't give that to him. And uh, again, that was pretty, that was lame. <laughs> and it was the best book going on, Marvel Two and One, except yeah. then there was like a, a few delays, and then the different artists, and it kind of fell away because, again, uh, the new FF was coming in, and this made the last issues of Marvel Two and One not really seem that important, or actually. The entirety of the series. I, they were looking for Reed and Sue in the beginning of that story, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And the very first issue of Fantastic Four, they're looking for Reed and Sue. <laughs> you know, everything that was going in Marvel Two and One should have led right into Fantastic Four, and they totally screwed that. Screw the pooch on that one. Why should Chip Zdarsky emotionally invest in the characters that he's writing if he's not going to be rewarded when he goes out there and kicks ass, takes names, and puts out a great story? You know, they just blow through artists, and next by the end of it, you know, they weren't even really comic artists. It was just some blobs on a page with some speech yeah. bubbles. Yeah, it was. It wasn't good, unfortunately. They they didn't respect Chip Zdarsky. They didn't respect the fans. They just yeah. wanted to get that crap out. But yeah, it's crazy the way it feels. Like sometimes it's like, what am I still doing here? Why yeah. why do why do I let them do this to me? I'm better than this, Huel. <laughs> we just love what we love. And even if Marvel is screwing around, even if DC is screwing around, I mean any other company could do this also and just not care about something. It just seems like these mega corporations are the ones that do it more than anything. I don't know why we stick around. Again, it's like, you know, it's a uh, it's an abusive relationship, and it's really hard to get out. In 2012 to 2017, Valiant had the best shared superhero universe in comics. They even did me dirty. They changed the entire direction. Like they, they, they got rid of all the creative directors, and just, just a, it's a pile of nothing now. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, Rise is my favorite character. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. When Matt Kent and Creighton Crane's Rye, which you know goes right into the 4001 AD event, is like it's a masterpiece of just comic book writing and art, like melding together and creating one of the truly uh, the best comic stories I've ever read in my life. And then they bring in Dan Abnett to follow up to relaunch the Rye character at, at Valiant with Fallen World, which is like a little four year four issue like miniseries, and then they relaunched. Uh, Rye with Abnett on it. Abnett's a really good writer. Damn good writer, if I'm being mm-hmm. honest. I, yeah. Uh, I, I I can't believe the I can't remember the name of the the artist. But when when I I read the first issue of Fallen World, I was like, well, if I'd never read a Rye before, this would be a pretty good comic book. It's it's well constructed and everything, but it it doesn't lift anything from the story that's already there. It's not true to the character and everything. And then it, it just bled right into the new Rye series. There's there shouldn't be a comic book I'm more excited about on the market. Than Rye from Valiant Comics, and but you can see by the sales they lost all of, anybody that would like that character immediately jumped off when they yeah. realized it's not the right, it's not the same character. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hadn't read that one, but going back to Matt Kent, I really like his work, even his uh, creator. So this is what a situation where you know why do I stick with this company? Well, if Matt Kent's not there, what you might want to do is just go to whatever he's doing somewhere else. But again, if you have a connection with that company character, you're not given that, you know, you're left out in the wind, <laughs> hoping that somebody else is going to come on and respect that character or do what you want to read. You know, it's not necessarily what you want as a reader, but it's something that you want to find out, you know, what's going to happen with it. And if it just ignores things that just don't make sense with it, you're less likely to care. And that's another thing where it feels like DC, I thought you cared about your characters and their continuity. I mean, you 
told Jack Kirby, you, 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 you drew over Jack Kirby's Superman face. So he would look like all the other Supermans. What happened to that company? And then you let Bendis come in and just basically do anything he wants. Is there any respect for the long-term fans? Or are you just trying to get as many people as possible to read it? I haven't seen a number increase in the sales of Superman at all. Um, so I can tell you right now. It's not working that way. Not for me personally. Bendis came over. Obviously, he launched out on, on Action Comics 1001 after the, the Man of Steel miniseries. Um, the sales for Action Comics in Superman were higher when Bendis arrived. Like, well, you know, there, there's going to be more attrition over the years. But think about this. They were t- twice monthly books then. The sales were higher per issue, and they were doing two of them a month. Mm-hmm. And his, his sales are both, it's, I think it's 35,000 and 32,000. Right. For Superman in action. Superman's under 40,000. Unfathomable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Superman's always been kind of, I mean, personally for me, he's my favorite DC character, other than maybe some of like the B characters, C characters. Uh, oh, usually you have. Him. Yeah, That's exactly. Great. I mean, I'm a Flash guy, uh, whether it's Wally West or Barry Allen, I'm usually pretty cool with them. I also like, you know, Green Lantern, and Booster Gold, you know, that type of stuff. But Superman is like my kind of go-to character in the DCU if I was going to just read one. Anytime I'm talking to normal people out there, they look at Superman as like too powerful, somebody that doesn't have a real uh, personality, you know, and I'm like, well, you don't read Superman, obviously. (laughs) So he's kind of a hard sell unless he's like on the big screen where you don't have to really pay so you know, much attention to who he is, you know, it's just, uh, especially these days, you know, uh, get a Superman movie out there and Hey, Bendis, you'll see him punch somebody. <laughs> you can get some Rogel Czar on the big screen. <laughs> Rogel Czar. Woo. <laughs> and nope. same thing. Matt Kent. Not outside of Marvel. If yeah. Darcy is not writing for Marvel, I will not read it. I actually read all. two of his comics. Way too adult oriented, way too uh-huh. many fairy dicks and stuff yeah. like that. Well, that's book. true. Never uh, again. Chip Zdarsky might want to hold off on that recommendation yes. to look at Otherwise, somewhere else. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> if you. 